phone makes some noise. Wow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Wow. You all are on fire tonight. You may be seated. I just want to tell you how delighted and honored I am and on behalf of some of our team that's here with me and my wife and my children, we just thank you for spoiling us and uh, making us feel loved and feeling right at home. I feel like I, I got more than I gave. I was just so blessed uh, just to be here and to worship with you and to be blessed in the services with you and, and to have an opportunity to share with you tonight. I'm just uh, indeed grateful. I leaned over and hugged Charles Neiman this afternoon and told him I, he just blew my socks completely off. He walked up there and said all of that gracious stuff about, you know, all the other speakers and then just preached till I couldn't even think of what my message was for tonight. <laughs> it's bad to sucker punch a preacher like that. <laughs> but I have something I want to share with you tonight that's on my heart tonight that I feel like the Holy Spirit has given to speak and to share into your heart and into your life tonight. And I'm excited to be blessed of the Lord to do it. I'm going to go right into the Word of God because I want to maximize my time with you. I'm going to be in Matthew 25, 14 through 29. I want to thank Brian and Bobby for their hospitality while you turn to that. They have just been so good. Um, he fed me so good today I had to repent. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I can go in the strength of that meat for 40 days. <laughs> Matthew 25, 14 through 29, when you have it, say amen. amen. Oh, that was kind of weak. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So I'm, I'm going to turn you into the potter's house tonight. I'm going to ask you to stand while I read the Word of God, because that's, that's how I do it. And Brian told me to be myself, so... I'm 56 years old, it's too late to change. <laughs> and when you, when you hear this, you, you, are hearing, you are hearing the master teacher, Jesus Christ, delivering a parable to explain to us that that we cannot see using a story that we can see. It is a parable about the kingdom of heaven because the things that God has for us are beyond human comprehension. And yet Jesus introduces them to us in stories and parables, not so much that we might get caught up in the nuances of the story, but that we might learn the principles that are in the story because the principles are the principles of the kingdom. Somebody say principles of the kingdom. We're going to hear one tonight. Matthew 25, 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, and to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with him. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides him five talents more. Look at me, God, I did good. That's not in your Bible, that's in mine. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter into the joys of the Lord. He also that had two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, uh, 
the Lord, I, I knew that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not sprung. And watch this closely. I was afraid and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. And lo, there thou hast that which is thine. His Lord said unto him, Thou wicked and slow for servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not a gather, where I have not straw. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which have ten talents, for unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that have not, it shall be taken away that which he seemeth to have. Can the church say amen? amen? Remain standing. I'm going to pray with you while you're standing. I do that so that you can't sleep while I'm preaching. <laughs> Tonight I'm going to talk to you about the instinct to increase. The instinct to increase. Say that with me. The instinct to increase. Say it again. The instinct to increase. God never intended for you to stay where you started, in where you began, just maintain, neutralize, and wait on him. There is something down inside of you that God wants to bring forth. The very first command, the very first word that God said to man was be fruitful. And I say to you tonight in the name of Jesus that you are coming into abundance in every area of your life. I say to you tonight that God didn't give you a cup that he doesn't want to run over. I speak increase over your life. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about ministry. I'm talking about gifts of the Spirit. I'm talking about wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And every area of your life, abundance is coming to you if you have the instinct to increase. Let's pray. Sweet Holy Spirit, seize this moment to speak in this place. Hide my flesh behind the cross. There's nothing exceptional about me. There's everything marvelous about you. If they hear from me and don't hear from you, they're coming in vain. But if you speak tonight, just one word will cause dead men to come out of the grave. Speak in this house. Great God that you are, I believe you for supernatural miracles. Let this message outlive me and let it outlast me and let it be meat and nourishment to the souls of your people. I thank you for what you're about to do. I turn it all over to you. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. No, I said somebody shout amen. amen. Oh, that sounds good. Sit down. Woo! I like that good old Australian amen. Y'all got lungs down here. Shout amen! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Woo. Come on, give him a praise. I'm coming along. I'm coming along. Take me slow. I had the privilege several years ago, I was invited by these businessmen in South Africa uh, to come over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody here from South Africa? I love it. I love it. Cape Town and Sydney are two of my favorite cities in all the world. But I was over there ministering for a bunch of Christian businessmen who had come into an abundance of wealth and they wanted to submit all that they had into the hands of God and, and they invited me over to talk to them both about business and about faith and just a small group, wasn't a big crowd of people but it was an amazing time and, and one of the benefits that they gave me for being over there is one of them had such influence, he said, when you get through working, we're gonna take you on a safari. And, and I, being a hillbilly from the sticks in West Virginia, I thought that was pretty cool. And I got real excited. I had my son with me and I had my wife with me. And, and I'd never been on a safari before, so I, I went out and bought me some safari clothes. 
because you got to coordinate everything. You got to be looking good when you're out there with the elephants and stuff, you know, because they might take pictures of you or something. So I, I looked like I knew what I was doing. I was excited, and they said, we're going to take you over in a little plane, and you're going to land on the runway and everything like that, and it's kind of out in a little remote area, but it's going to be cool. And we got on the little plane. I was cool, and my son was cool, and my wife was there. Yeah, she was there, she was there. And I was really cool with it, because I, uh, I pictured a runway with a tower and a control tower and, and everything. There was no control tower anywhere. <laughs> there was a little runway, just a strip going through the jungle. No lights or nothing on it. And we had to wait before we land because there was a rhinoceros out in the middle of the runway. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I knew this wasn't going to exactly be like what I had in mind when I started. But I was still cool because the little boy in me is kind of crazy and rough. And I thought, oh, this is going to be good. And my son was down with it. He's ready to go do it. And my wife was just there. <laughs> they took us out to this, uh, this, it was like a monstrosity of a mansion out in the middle of the jungle. And it was really cool. It was, it was uh, uh, J. Paul Getty's house, and it was really some place that I couldn't have gone had they not just allowed me to go. And it was wonderful. It was real plush. It was real nice. I was having a good time until they said, don't go out the, the house at night, you know, be, be, because I, the, the animals are free. Now, you have to understand, in the States we have animals, but, but they're in cages and stuff like that. And we're free, and the animals are in cages. And so this was an international concept that I was not exactly familiar with. And I decided I was going to go anyway. So my son and I, we put on our outfits, and we got up early that morning, and we said, we're going out on the safari. And they brought this big old Jeep up, and we got on the Jeep. And he said, I said, are you ready? That's what he said, yeah, Dad, I'm ready. We jumped on the Jeep. My wife wasn't there. <laughs> she felt led of the Lord to stay at home and pray for us. <laughs> so we got on the Jeep and we're riding out there, you know, and, and it was interesting because the guy who was giving us the tour and going to show us all of these unique animals, I mean lions and elephants and all of this fantastic stuff, he was a zoologist and it was amazing. It was, it, he, it was amazing because he knew all of this stuff about the animals, how the animals' teeth were cut a certain way so that when they bit into certain branches, the branches were, were cut in such a way that they would be pruned and still be fruitful. It was amazing. How smart our God is, that he is a God of detail, that every aspect of their created fiber fit into the environment in which they had been created so that they could function and eat and survive without losing anything or destroying anything. He was explaining to me everything. He was explaining to me like this amazing stuff, how he could look like at the dung of the animals and tell, you know, whether it was a male or a female or which way it went and all that kind of stuff. I looked at it. I didn't see too much, but, 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 <laughs> I can smell something, but I didn't see nothing. But uh, <clears throat> I, I, I was on the Jeep with my son and myself and the zoologist who was a professor from a university who had a wealth, a wealth of knowledge and information and intellect, and he could explain everything about the animals. He could explain everything about them. But, but there was a Zulu who was sitting on the front of the Jeep in a small little chair with, with some kind of like, some kind of big old, uh, 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 outfit on, and he was sitting out there, and, 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 and the zoologist could explain about the animals. He knew everything about the animals, but he couldn't find them. The Zulu who was sitting on the edge of the Jeep said, the elephant is over there. And all of a sudden, Something hit me in right smack dab in the middle of my ball head. I said, I am sitting right in between intellect and instinct. Intellect can explain it, but only instinct can find it. Instincts 
instinct is an inborn pattern of behavior that is characteristics of a species whereby you have a motivation or impulse or a gut knowing. Or if you're a spiritual being, it's a prompting of the Holy Spirit. It defies logic or intellect, bypasses senses or reasoning, has nothing to do with what you read or studied or learned in school. It's, it's the inner impulse, the, the nudging of the Holy Spirit to react beyond information. Now, intellect is real important. It's very, very important. You've got to have intellect. The more intelligent you are, it's, that too is a gift from God. But intellect without instinct will cause you to fall short from the elephant is over there. <laughs> I said that good, didn't I? <laughs> Try that with me. The elephant is over there. <laughs> oh, y'all are messing that up. You just see. You take that Australian and mix it with that African, it just falls over in the floor. I'm going to give you one more time. Say it. The elephant is over there. Good. You did good. Give yourselves a big round of applause. <laughs> Jesus in my text tonight is teaching us the kingdom of heaven is lacking. The kingdom of heaven is like. It's not this, but it's like this. He's using something that you can understand to explain something that is beyond human reasoning. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a master, he says, who called his servants and gave them. Now, we, I want you to catch this. You, you have the master and the servant. And if you read that with your Australian mind or your American mind or wherever you came from, if you read it through the lens of that mind in the society in which you have been raised, in which you have been developed, or in which you have been extrapolated, you will miss the power of these words because you've got the master, and one translation says the master and the slave, and the master master and the slave are worlds apart. Trust me, those are not the same things at all. Jesus existed in an environment where most of the societies in which he lived during his era were in a caste system. It was not a democracy. A caste system suggests whatever status of life you are born in, you belong there. So if you were born a slave, then you stayed a slave. If you were born a master, you stayed a master. If you were born poor, you stayed poor. If you were born wealthy, you stayed wretched. There was no feeling of responsibility to raise one person up into another status of life. It is a caste system, the haves and the have-nots, the ins and the out, the master and the slave, the rich and the poor, and never the twain shall meet. So the whole notion that this master who owns the slave is getting ready to go on a trip and he doesn't give it to his children, he doesn't give talents to his heirs, he bypasses his neighbors and gives it to a slave is shocking. You don't give your master stuff to a slave. That's crazy. That's awesome. That's, that's mind-boggling. The slave has been gifted with master stuff. He didn't earn it. He didn't work for it. He didn't labor to get it. He has been gifted. God wants you to understand as far as the master is from the slave, that's how far we are from God. He said, my thoughts are above your thoughts, my ways above your ways, as high as the heavens are above the earth. That's the gulf that exists between me and you. You can't work your way up to me. You can't earn your way up to me. You can't be good enough to get up to me. Never the twain shall meet. We are far apart. It is not where the slave works his way up to the master. It is where the master comes down and gifts the slave. It was not where I came up to God. The story is that God came down to me. And the slave has been gifted. Say this with me, I am gifted. The 
doesn't mean that. That's not bragging. See, y'all are scared to say it because you don't want to sound like you're arrogant or proud or anything. You want to always appear to be humble at all times, particularly when you're around other Christians because you are evaluated on a scorecard based on how humble you act. But tonight, just because Bishop Jakes is up here and you got to put up with me for about 30 more minutes, just go ahead and say, I am gifted. I am fearfully and marvelously made. There's all kinds of stuff in me. There's all kinds of talent. There's all kinds of creative ability that I didn't learn in school. There's stuff that you can do that you don't even know how you can do it. You just can do it. You have just been gifted. You are so gifted that whoever gets you gets a gift. You are an asset and not a liability. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You got some good stuff. Somebody shout, I am gifted. I have been gifted. There's some things that you can do that you don't even know how you can do it. You can just do it. I mean little simple things. It doesn't have to be big things like, 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 like cook or, or dress or build or design or create. And you just got a knack for something. You don't even know where you got it from. God in his infinite wisdom just came down and gifted you. Yes, sir, buddy. Yes, sir, buddy. If you don't understand what you have, you don't understand how to keep it, you don't understand how to value it, and you can't create, understand when you lose it. You have to understand that you are a gift. And whenever you come in the room, the only thing that doesn't add to the sum total of a number is a zero. And if you are not a zero, you are an addition. Shout, I am gifted. And the master gave to the slave. The slave is the recipient of something that breaks the social order of his day. The talents, in this case really money, it has been given to him, just given to him. That's a crazy story. Let me tell you something, my ancestors were slaves. Let me tell you something, my great-great-grandmother was a slave and I remember her, I met her, and let me tell you something, masters don't go out in the field and give slaves no money or anything else. But God uses this illustration to say, that's what I have done to you. I have gifted you. Every single solitary person in this room has been gifted. And in fact, I want all the gifted people to give God a praise. That's how you acknowledge that you know that you have been gifted. You don't sit there with your legs crossed looking all cute and trying to be humble and not acknowledge that you received a gift. I hate to give people gifts that don't act like it's a big deal when I give you a gift. When I give you a gift, I want a reaction. I want you to shout or cry or holler or something. Come on, somebody. I have been And the Bible says that once he had gifted them, he, he didn't gift them the same. Now, understand this, and, and, and to one he gave five talents, and to the other one he gave two, and to the other one he gave one. He, to one he gave five, and to another one he gave two, and to the other one he gave one. Three different slaves, three different amounts, all different amounts given to different people. The, the one who had five looked at the one who had two and said, mine doesn't look like yours. And the one who had two looked at one and said, one and said it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing. But, but all of them had been gifted. I learned something about God. God is not fair. God is not fair. I can tell by the way that brother just sung a minute ago, God is not fair. You can sing like that, that's not fair. You know, some of y'all sound like a bunch of cats <laughs> stabbed in the neck when you sing. <laughs> I don't mean that in an offensive way. I mean that 
in, in the most polite possible way. You do not have the ministry of music. You make a joyful noise, but make it to the Lord because we do not want to hear you do it. God is not fair, but he is just. Fair would be two for you, two for you, two for you, two for you, two for you. That would be fair, but just says, I'm not worried about being fair. The Bible said he gave them according to their ability. Bless God, I'm ready to shout. You know what I'm ready to shout about? I'm ready to shout because the Bible said God gave gifts, the master gave gifts according to ability that he considered what I could handle before he gave it to me. Lord, don't give me a gift I can't handle. Lord, don't give me an opportunity I can't handle. Lord, don't give me an open door that I can't handle. Don't give me anything that's too high for me or too great for me. Give me what I'm able to handle. When they built this stage, they have a weight load specification. They built it to handle a certain amount of weight. Now, I'm pushing it to the limit tonight. <laughs> But they considered what it could handle before they put me up here. That's why it's not good to be jealous of anybody because you might ask to be like somebody else and get something that you were not built to handle. Give me what I can handle. I'm, oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. Aren't you glad God considered your ability before he put something on you that drove you crazy, gave you a nervous breakdown, pushed you over the edge, became too much for you? Every blessing is not a blessing and every success is not success. Joshua said God would give you good success. If there is good success, there's got to be bad success. You don't want what other people have. You want what God has for you. And so to one he gave five and to one he gave two. And to the other one, he gave one. One guy's got five, one's got two, one's got one, each according to his ability. The one thing they all had in common is what we have in common tonight. They didn't have the same talents. They didn't have the same amount. But all three of them had an opportunity. And tonight, you may not have what the person next to you has, you might not can do what they can do. You might not look like what they look like. You may not have their resources. You might not can play those guitars like those boys were playing the guitar. You may not can play those drums like they do. You may not can speak like somebody can speak or sing like somebody can sing or draw like somebody can draw or build like somebody else can build. But the one thing we all have in common, when we woke up this morning and we were not dead, we woke up with an opportunity. The brother who had five immediately went to work and said, whoa, I got five, but I see how it can be 10. And he took what he had been given and turned it into something. That's what every pastor wants on his staff. He wants people on his staff, if I hand you some work to do, I don't want you to just hand it back to me like I gave it to you. I want you to take it and turn it into something. That's what you want. That's what, that's what, let me tell you, that's what Moses got out of his staff. Moses did miracles with his staff, not because it was a stick, but because it was able to turn into something. And when I give you a job to do, I want you to not just hold it like it is, but turn it into something. Want your magic on it and make it more than what it was when I handed it to you. Be fruitful. Turn that opportunity into something. Turn that department into something. Turn that church into something. Turn that house into a home. Turn that woman into a wife. Turn that man into a husband. Turn that kid into a man. Turn it into something. Do your magic on it. Make it more than what it was. Brother number five said, hey, I see how it can be 10. Cut God Almighty. Brother number two said, excuse me, I see how it can be four. And brother number one said, now, you know, when he come back, he, I don't want to take no chances. And so the Bible said he was afraid and he hid his talent in the earth. His mistake is the mistake I've come to warn you of. 
If you expose your fear, you bury your talent. You need to reverse it. You need to bury your fear and expose your talents. Tonight I want to challenge you. Everybody has fear. Everybody has fear. But you don't let your fear have you. Tonight, if you're going to do what God has called you to do, you have got to reverse the process. Stop exposing your fear. Bury your fear up under the blood of the cross and the word of Jesus Christ and lift up your talent and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And when you switch that process, demons tremble and hell gets nervous. Curses are broken and yokes are destroyed. People are set free and your life is built over again. Do you have the courage? Yeah. Somebody shout yes! Yeah. When God gives you an opportunity, you need to work your magic on it and turn it into something. Brother five turned it into 10, brother two turned it into four, and brother one, well, he kind of messed up my story a little bit because he kind of just, what had happened was, uh, he, he, he never turned his opportunity into anything because of his fear. And the Lord sent me to ask you a question. What are you going to do with what he has given you? What are you going to do with the life he has given you and the talent he has given you and the time he has given you and the influence he has given you and the gifts he has given you and the resources he has given you and the creativity he has given you. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? There's somebody in the hospital wishing they could be where you are right now. There's somebody on a breathing machine wishing they could be where you are right now. But look at you. I know you got some problems and I know you got some issues, but you call combed your own hair, you got up out of the bed, you brushed your own teeth, you dressed yourself. What are you going to do with what God has given you? Anyway, the story goes on. The master took a journey, went into a far country, and he came back. When he came back, he came back, walked up to brother number five, brother number five, said, hey, I've been waiting on you to get back. I got something to show you. Remember when you gave me five? Shazam! I'm bad he did that little Michael Jackson thing. Ten. Brother number two said, excuse me, let me show you some Shazam. Four. I imagine in my mind, brother number 10 looked at brother number four and said, how can you be that happy about four? I got 10 and you got four. And if brother number four, if he had any sense, would have told brother number 10, I may not have as many as you have, but both of us have a 100% increase over where we started. <laughs> what I want you to see out of that is that God does not expect you to work with what he has not given you. God is not holding you to somebody else's standard. What God is holding you to is to work that thing on your level. <laughs> you can't sit around and say, I wish I had more. If I had more, I'd do more with it. No, you don't have to give an account for what God gave me or God gave her or what God gave him. You do have to give an account for what God has given you. And rather than to compare yourself with somebody else, you need to work that thing on your level. <laughs> somebody help me in here. Touch somebody and say, I'm ready to work that thing. I'm ready to work that thing. I'm ready to work that thing. I'm ready to come up out of my fear and my doubt and my worry. I'm ready to work that thing. I'm ready to work every day and every opportunity and every door he opens. I'm ready to work that thing. I'm ready to work that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, touch three people and say, work that thing, work that thing, work that thing. Work it. Work it in the mission fields. 
Work it in the church. Work it in the ministry. Work it in the music department. Work it in the children's ministry. When you get back to your church, work that thing. It may not be big like this. You may not have all the equipment like this. You may not have a lighting system. All you got is a flashlight. But baby, work that thing, work that thing, work, 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 work. work. Come on, shout in this place. I want to get you so fired up that hell gets nervous when you pull out of the parking lot. I want the devil to get hiccups when you wake up out of the bed in the morning. Because with all of your might and with all of your strength, according to what you have been given, you need to work that thing. 80 years old and you're still alive, work that thing. If you got a wheelchair, spin it around in the floor and work that thing. Whatever God gave you, this is your year to work that thing. When you go to class, work that thing. So, the master came back. So the story goes, five turned it to 10, two turned it into four. Brother one said, uh, I, I, I kept what you gave me. I didn't put a spin on it. I didn't make it better. If God brings somebody in your life, make them better. If God gives you a talent, make it better. If God opens up a financial blessing, don't just hold it in your hand. Make it better. And so the master looked at him, he got mad. He said, you should have put my money to the exchange. You should have done something with what I gave you. You should have done something with every day. You should have done something with every opportunity. You should have done something with every day of your life. You should have done something. You should have stopped crying and complaining. You should have done something. I felt bad for brother one. I'm just that kind of person. I'm always for the underdog. Yeah, I could have been Judas's lawyer. I said, Lord, this is not fair because when you read the text carefully, you didn't tell brother five, brother two, or brother one to increase. You never told them to increase. You gave them what you gave them and left. You did not command them to increase. So you're judging this brother kind of hard, Lord, because he, you know, his brother had a hard life, Lord. He'd been through a lot of stuff, Jesus. You never told him to increase. He said, no, this is not about commandment. It's about instinct. Do you have the instinct to increase. And I thought, oh my God, you never commanded them to increase, but you expected them to increase. The kingdom of heaven will not command you to increase, but he expects you to increase. That's why he says stuff like be fruitful and multiply. I expect you to take everything I gave you and give increase to what I've given you. And I said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Let me, let, me, let me try to figure this out. Let me try to figure it out. And, 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 and I said, uh, in, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And then all of a sudden, the Lord called 10 witnesses out. And he said, do you remember the 10 lepers? They came before Jesus and, 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 and they said, oh, 
oh, Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus says to the ten lepers, go show yourself. Listen to this. This is a command. Go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible said that all ten of them started moving toward the priest. But while they were headed to the priest, one of them, all of them looked down and they began to see that they were healed. Isn't it something that when you start walking in the Word, you get healing in your life? You don't have to struggle, you don't have to labor, but the more you obey God, the more His healing power operates in your life. And as they were walking, they all began to experience the healing, but one of them turned around and went back to Jesus and said, Lord, I just came to say thank you. And Jesus looked at the one and said, where are the nine? And I said, Lord, you didn't tell them to come back. You told them to go show themselves to the priest. He said, yes, but I put an instinct down inside of you that when you get your blessing, I shouldn't have to tell you to praise me. I shouldn't have to tell you to trust me. You ought to have the instinct. So tonight, you don't need anybody to tell you to praise the Lord. You don't need all this fine equipment. You don't need all of this sound system. You don't need me. You don't need singers or drums or tambourines or bongos. You need something down inside of you that says, God has been so good to me that I cannot leave this place without giving him the highest praise and blessing him for all that he's done for me. So what I'm going to ask you to do for the next 30 seconds, everybody who's got a gift, everybody who's ever been blessed, everybody who's ever been touched, everybody who woke up out of the bed this morning, everybody who's ever been healed, everybody who's ever been set free, open your mouth and give Yes! 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 You got five seconds left! Take the roof off this place! praising him. While you're praising him, I speak increase over your life. I speak increase over your church. I speak increase over your preaching. I speak increase over your ministry. I speak increase in your family. I speak the blessing of the Lord. You're going to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in your coming in, blessed in your going out. Blessed, 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 blessed. Give God praise. He sends brother one in the outer darkness, but to brother four and brother 10, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy master. I came to tell Hillsong, there's about to be a shift. Because you've been faithful over a few things, God is about to make you ruler over many. And before I leave this stage tonight, I want every born again, baptized, spirit filled believer to turn around in a circle right now. Just turn right around in a circle. God is about to turn things around in your life. God is about to move you into another dimension. God is about to take you into orbit. God is about to raise you up. God is about to establish you. God is about to enter in.
You see, any slave can follow instructions, obey rules, but masters move by instinct. Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, and offer him up. If Abraham would obey, obey that first command without listening for that next voice, he would have slayed his son. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Are you walking in what God has said or are you walking in what God is saying? There he is an instinct that causes you to bring in the harvest. There is an instinct that tells the mother when it's time to have the baby. There is an instinct that separates the good from the great. It is not their intellect. It is not what they read in the book. It is not who you know. It is the elephant is over there. When you leave when you leave this place, go get your elephant. <laughs> I want to pray tonight for unborn dreams. for hopes that you can't quite touch yet. I want to pray for people who have an unction on the inside that doesn't even fit your situation. I want to pray for people that every time the devil says give up and die, there's something inside of you saying no, live, 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 live. I want to pray for people that if we looked at your background, you should have been a basket case. You should have had a nervous breakdown and lost your mind. But there's something in your gut, in your heart, in your spirit, in your innermost being that said, hold on. That instinct, that still small voice, that push of God is about to turn your life around. You've been shouting because you survived. You've been thanking God that you made it through your storm and your sorrow and your tears and your midnights. You've been thanking God that he sustained you when all hell was breaking loose. But I came to tell you that God didn't sustain you for you to stay where you are. He sustained you because your best days are in front of you. He sustained you because he's about to take you into another dimension. He sustained you because he has a purpose and a reason for your life. And the devil wouldn't try to kill you if you weren't headed somewhere. Your elephant is over there. Did you hear what I said? Your elephant is over there.
Did you all hear what I said? Your elephant is over there. The reason you survived all hell breaking loose in your life is because your elephant is over there. Don't you stop till you get your elephant. Don't you stop till you build that church. Don't you stop till you birth that ministry. Don't you stop until you turn that house into a home. That huddle into a family. That mess into a message. That test into a testimony. Don't you stop until you see increase. Until you see harvest. Until you see the blessing of the Lord. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. Somebody shout in this house. Join hands. Leave no one untouched. Span the aisles. Brother number 10, touch brother number four. Brother number four, grab brother one. We're coming out of this tonight. God's about to wake up the dead. Dead dreams, dead hopes, dead prophecies, dead miracles, dead ministries. Your zeal for God is coming back. Your zeal for God is coming back. Your harvest is about to break forth. Somebody's going to get financial breakthroughs. You've been dealing with a tough time, but God is saying increase, even over your finances. Squeeze that hand you're holding. I want you to know what a miracle feels like. Because the person you're holding in your hands is a miracle from God. You might not know their story and you might not know what they've been through, but trust me, they are a survivor. You're touching a survivor tonight. Now, God, you wouldn't have taken us through all you took us through to leave the hunt without the elephant, to build a church without souls, to have a sermon without salvation, to plow and not reap, to sow and not harvest. Squeeze that hand. God brought you to heal song, to stir your instincts, to show you where your elephant is. Your elephant is over there. Your elephant is over there. Your elephant is over there. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would seize this place and touch and heal and deliver and set free. That gifts would be stirred up. That ideas and creativity would be stirred up. That somebody would write that book. That somebody would open that business that somebody would start that ministry, that somebody would open up that shelter, that somebody would go in the mission field. I pray, oh God, right now in the name of Jesus, that somebody would build that house, that somebody would build that dream. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, somebody's about to record the glory of the Lord is released in this place. Squeeze that hand, the elephant. God said the elephant. The thing you've been waiting on, the thing the devil's been fighting you for, the elephant is over there. It's over there. It's over there. It's over there. It's over there. Don't stop till you find it because the elephant Give him your best praise, he'll say. Yes! 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 Yes!
about to work that thing. Somebody over there is about to work that thing. Somebody in the back is about to work that thing. Look how the elephant, they're about to work that thing. The elephant. Please be seated, I got it. This is my last opportunity, and Pastor asked me what I challenge you in giving tonight, in sowing. And I thought, yes, Lord. Because when I get through preaching tonight, somebody's about to go get that elephant. Somebody's about to reap that harvest. Somebody's about to see increase in their life. Somebody's about to step into another dominion. They're about to enter into the joys of the Lord. Your weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. I know in one way, Entering into the joys of the Lord can be heaven, but that doesn't mean you have to be in hell while you're waiting on it. As we sow tonight, there's been some things that God has done in this place that's priceless. The word that you've heard, the yokes that have been broken, I don't mean from me, but these speakers who've come from all over the place. Do y'all know that, maybe you don't know it. Do you know this is amazing? Do you know you got people flying through international date lines to experience the glory that's in this place right now? Let me tell you something. I don't care what university you went to. Preachers preach better up under the anointing. Singers sing better up under the anointing. Because when you're anointed, the anointing takes you into a dimension that you couldn't get in by yourself. It's the wind up under you that lifts you. If, if we preach better up under the anointing, if singers sing better up under the anointing, what would happen if we give up under the anointing of the Holy Spirit? I want to challenge you. I believe the anointing of God is in this place. I believe the anointing of God is in this place. It would be a shame for us to sit in this kind of anointing and this kind of glory and eat up these kinds of blessings and get up and belch and walk away and not say, Lord, we have a responsibility to sow into the God that has sown into us. We have a responsibility to sow in the direction that we are going. We're not sowing out of where we have been. We are sowing in the direction of where we are going. How many people in here are going somewhere? I want you to sow into your vision, into your dream, into the thing you have not touched yet. I want you to sow into the invisible, infallible, immutable. All you have to have is God's word on it. His word is good. His word is absolute. They've got some cards. I got to preaching and I might have thrown my card away. I think the elephant ate my card. Get these cards out. And I want you to sow in the, the, the direction that you're going. 
into the impulse and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I want you to sow into your elephant. I want you to respond to the value of the Holy Spirit. There's a couple of times I was sitting over there, I received so much word, I just started weeping. Because when you, I'm telling you, a word from God is priceless. I said a word from God is priceless. I was wiping tears this morning. I mean, I was wiping tears. I don't cry easy, especially in front of people. You gotta hold up your image. <laughs> I tried to act like, you know, somebody was cutting onions, but I didn't see no onions. I know the value of God's word kept me from dying, kept me from collapsing, stopped me from suicide, birthed a ministry inside of me, picked me up and turned me around. If you know the value of the word, if you've got a dream ahead of you that only God can help you to reach, I want you to sow in the direction that you're going. Obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit. These cards are available to you. And while you're writing, I'm praying, Father, bless every seed we sow. Bless every man, every pastor, every business owner, every writer, every dreamer, every student, every scholar, every teacher, every missionary, every person who has something in their heart, some instinct, some impulse, some waiting dream, some waiting hope that they cannot do without you, we sow into it right now in the name of Jesus. And we so mightily, and yes, Holy Spirit, as you speak tonight, we will say yes. We will not debate. We will not do what we have always done. Because if we do, we will be where we have always been. And we refuse to receive this word and go back to business as usual. We break the curse of normalcy. We break the curse of mediocrity. We break that curse right now in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord, we will say yes to your prompting. We will follow your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Write the biggest check you can. Sow the seed the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Sow in the direction that you are going because I declare unto you, the elephant is over there. <laughs>